Hello and welcome back to Philosophy and Humor. And uh, this week and next week, we're going to take a look at humor and postmodernism. Uh, the module slides kind of start off a little serious, as they should, because uh, the whole issue of postmodernism is a difficult one to pin down. So what I want to do at the beginning is to kind of give you a sense of what postmodernism is. And at the very least, it's something that follows modernism. That's a whole other issue. But before we do anything else, typically we go through the main points from last week's slides. Now, as I mentioned, because of the uh, technical glitch with um, with Zoom, I'm still not quite sure what happened, but the wrong date appeared, even though the date was showing Monday, etc. Uh, I will still cover this material next Monday, this coming Monday. Uh, it's Saturday morning right now, about a quarter after 11. Uh, but I will talk about these things, but it would be nice to kind of go through it first right here. So to review module nine, uh, humor and religion. My throw coat tea here. So tragedy and comedy start out of the, the same realm, which is ancient religious festivals. Uh, most of them built around Dionysus, the god of wine and revelry and madness as well and religion. Uh, so there was at one point an interconnection between humor and religion. Uh, in fact, in tragedy too. Uh, over time, especially after, after the, say, the year 1000, when the Christian church basically became the power, the, there were no political parties at that point. There was no democracy. There was no voting people in and out. The church was it. So at that time, the church did control what we now call social behavior and social interactions. Now, when we look at humor, right, we can look at the way in which humor is very different from religion, which is why we think at first that there's no real interaction. Uh, religion looks for meaning, for reason, for rationality, for security, predictability, uh, and moral truths. Humor, on the other hand, undermines all of that. It subverts all of that. It thrives on irrationality, absurdity, as we'll see today. Or a clip of Rick and Morty. Uh, absurdity and irrationality seems to be the order of the day in a postmodern world. And really, oddly enough, when I look at these, religion can represent sort of the modern world and humor the kind of postmodern world because uh, postmodernism does have irrationality, absurdity, dissent, chaos, anarchy, experimentation, hedonism, out of a whole range of different things. But that, in our review here, is what makes humor function. And it seems on the surface to be quite opposite to, to uh, religion. Now, at some point around the 1500s, the church finally seems to back away slightly from this hardcore uh, version of humor being horrible, humor being sinful. And humor starts being looked at as something that is uh, perhaps okay, right? To smile and to laugh a little bit is okay. And of course, they distinguished between good and bad laughter. Um, the smile seemed to be a sign of someone that was a decent human being. So the Greek church in particular uh, started this notion of the holy fool, the Greek church being around for a very, very long time. And it came up with this notion of the holy fool, which comes out of the carnival uh, tradition, where remember that world is turned upside down. And in this case, the holy fool tries to turn the world upside down. And the notion that we are fools for Christ's sake, uh, we're acting like a clown. And why are we doing this? Because we're trying to shock people out of their normal, typical, rational view of the world, that material world that we, that we exist in, uh, the reality of the material world it seems to work for us. But religion is about what lies beyond, right? Well, in certain cases, above and below, right? Heaven and hell, but beyond that. And so reality has this otherness, this other component that we cannot see, but we can certainly feel and we can think about. And that otherness, which is religious experience, is what the holy fool is able to tap into. And their behavior is supposed to represent this other world, right? That otherness that is part of our existence, but we don't tend to think about it very often. So the Feast of Fools and the Holy Fool are figures that come out of religious thought and are these sort of social figures that are a connector between the, the world beyond, which is what religion is concerned with, and the material world that we live in. So the Holy Fool, just like humor itself, undermines reason, right? It turns reason on its head, like the carnivalistic world. So the Fool rejects um, 
reality and mater the material world because it seems to also reject faith because the world we think about typically is one that is uh, carved up and explained to us by science, right? By science and rationality. Well, religion isn't that, right? It's not irrational, but it is beyond rationality. At one point, we have to make that leap of faith and say, beyond logic and reason, is this other world? Now, while we're here uh, in our own world, uh, things don't always have to be easy and simple. Quite often, they're not. Sometimes they are incomprehensible. And Jewish humor in particular, uh, because of the, the plight of the Jews throughout history, uh, being oppressed, being marginalized, being silenced, being murdered, uh, the incomprehensibility of life is something that they have learned to deal with because in the, the Judaic tradition, there is no final word, right? There is no Pope to say, this means this. There's endless discussion, debate, disagreement, dissent, and people try to argue back and forth that their, their take is the right one. So if that is the case, there is certainly room for disagreement and there's room for subversion sometimes of whatever's the, the prevailing uh, interpretation of the day. And then uh, the la that was Judaism. The last one uh, that we looked at, the last religion, was uh, Hindu and Buddhism. And Buddhist thought in particular should sound very familiar because it sounds very much like what Schopenhauer and Kierkegaard had told us uh, last month. So the idea of not sweating the small stuff. Right? That's really what, what they are talking about. And a Buddhist view of the world is one where there is an acknowledgement that, yes, uh, life is difficult, life is suffering. And if we can sort of detach ourselves periodically from that material world and the, the suffering and the incongruities and the absurdities of life, if we can do that and we can devote some degree of mental flexibility to kind of focusing our attention on what really matters, right? The bigger picture, right? That's why people say, don't sweat the small stuff. Uh, and it's true. But, you know, when you've got an assignment due in a couple of days, guess what? The small stuff is the big stuff. And so sometimes you've got to prioritize. But generally speaking, in our everyday world, there are things that are worth considering that are serious and should be looked at with a degree of seriousness. And then there are things that we should maybe just laugh off and just go, you know, it's not as important as you think it is. And the big picture, right? People say that. The big picture, um, it's not that important. That's a kind of Buddhist view of the world. And if you have that kind of mental flexibility, you're going to be okay. You're, you're going to do just fine. So that's essentially a, a review of Module 9. I can certainly go through it again on Monday when we meet properly this time, and I'll make sure that there are no glitches. Again, I don't know what happened, but I apologize uh, because I usually see lots of people that show up for our, our Zoom meeting. Okay, so we're going to be talking about humor and postmodernism. And humor has been around for a very long time. We, I think we said maybe the second week we got together that humor is a characteristic of the earliest social formations, the earliest social uh, groups. So it's part of who we are. Uh, but humor as a cultural phenomenon is, uh, it's really now part and parcel of this, what we call this postmodern world. And again, it's post what? All well, this postmodernism, depending on who you ask, and I mean that because an economist will say modernity starts at this point, an architect at that point, an artist somewhere else, a writer somewhere else. But generally speaking, again, generally speaking, modernism and modernity uh, is a product of the 19th century. Uh, generally speaking, it is uh, a different subjective relationship to reality. And what happens is science, industry, uh, technology begins to reorganize and reinvent. And I'm being very polite here because some people that cause a lot of grief. It begins to change our relationship to each other, to reality, to society, to the world. And that's modernity, right? That's the, the if you were to look for a definition of modernity, it is that, that change and that subjective relationship we have with, with the world in all of its facets. So the postmodernism is a kind of acceleration of this relationship. And so uh, postmodernism is believed to start kind of in earnest following the Second World War. So it is a, a sort of late 20th century phenomenon, well, mid 20th century, 1945. 
And if you were to talk about some of the aspects of it, there is a degree of playfulness. There is a degree of self-consciousness that uh, what we were saying may not be original or new. Um, there's a degree of irony, sort of looking at something and valuing it, but in an ironic way. Uh, people will talk about, you know, liking a band ironically. Uh, you know, I like so-and-so group or so-and-so singer ironically. Sure. Okay. That's something that a person would not have said a hundred years ago. You like something because you like it, but you like to like something ironically is what you like it because other people like it, or you like it because it's kind of dorky and goofy or whatever. But this kind of, again, this change in the relationship, that subjective relationship we have with the world is part of what is both uh, a characteristic of modernism, but very much a characteristic of postmodernism. So playfulness, self-consciousness, irony, uh, really in the end, a reluctance to take anything, even itself seriously. Now, I cannot think of any better example than the Deadpool franchise. Uh, the first one to me, I still really like a lot. And so I want you to think about the Deadpool theatrical trailer, not the entire movie here, uh, although I, I love the movie. Uh, and it works because Ryan Reynolds doesn't take himself seriously. And that is really part and parcel of what the Deadpool character is all about. He embodies postmodernism. All the things that you like about Deadpool, right? You know, he's goofy and silly and he's cracking jokes and, you know, then all of a sudden he can get serious and then he's not serious. That's what postmodernism is. So he is, to me, a very good characteristic or at least a representation of what postmodernism is all about. So once again, the links should be right down here. Um, I actually tried it last week to see if it was going to work. And luckily, when you go back to this video, it kind of picks up where it left off, which is what I was hoping was going to do, because you're kind of bouncing back and forth. So I know this works. So please have a look at the Deadpool theatrical trailer, uh, because it's full of these goofy, self-conscious, playful kind of things that we've talked about. Uh, and I'll see you back in just a moment. Okay, so playfulness and irony and self-consciousness. All of these things are part of what uh, characterizes postmodernism. There is something else that's going on too, and that is this refusal to categorize art as either high or low. Um, opera versus going to, you know, to see a rock band in a bar, uh, going to see uh, the ballet versus to, you know, versus the monster truck <laughs> show or something. And what happens is there's a kind of a mixing together of ideas uh, from that upper echelon of high art or, or you know, philosophy, and then kind of taking it down to the streets. Um, the, the example I have here from Banksy, you know, one original thought is worth a thousand mindless quotings, uh, uh, Diogenes. Uh, Diogenes is a Greek or was a Greek philosopher, an Athenian philosopher who said that, but it appears in a Banksy, uh, painting, right? Painted on a wall. So interesting sort of juxtaposition, right? Uh, that whole notion of incongruity. That is absolutely at the heart of postmodernism. So postmodern art, for example, it undermines its own status as something that is original. It, it literally calls attention to itself as, hey, you've read this somewhere else. You've seen this somewhere else. I'm just going to reframe it. And that's kind of what happens with postmodernism. There's a sense of always already there, or at least always already said or done or spoken or heard, uh, because it becomes very difficult to be original in this postmodern world because there's this notion that everything's already been said and it's just a matter it's a matter of mixing it up differently right um another good example of postmodernism is hip-hop culture and sampling sampling taking music from another era and introducing it into something new and uh putting together uh found sounds sampled sounds together and then singing over top of it that is a postmodern art form that could not have existed at any other time partly because of the technology, but partly because of its status as not original. We know they're sampled sounds, but old folks like me go crazy trying to figure out what was that sample. I digress. But anyway, so postmodern art, uh, it's endlessly referencing other pre-existing texts or images or ideas or music and so on. Uh, it knows that it's not original. Postmodernism also uh, rejects this idea that somehow a, a piece of art or a poem or a text 
somehow can present these transcend transcendent, in other words, standing outside of something, these transcendent eternal values. Uh, truth is no longer with a capital T. It should be a small, you know, small case or lowercase t, and likely in quotations, right? People do this a lot, right? That's a postmodern thing. So the notion that eternal truths are, can be contained in a postmodern text, that's just not what we go reading and listening to, uh, to these pieces of art. Uh, you know, that's what we're not there. That's, we're not there for that. We're not there for truth. We just want to see what they've done. So there is a kind of postmodern relationship or position towards the world. And anyone that tries to make those claims, right, we should mistrust them, right? Uh, you know, I am the way and, and I know what I'm doing and you know, follow me and you'll be just fine. Uh, there's a degree of distrust because we know that it has brought us, well, to the brink of the breakdown of civilization, uh, Western Europe. Not one, but two world wars in a matter of 20 years. So, transcendental eternal truths? No. Nah. No thanks. I'm just fine the way I am. So, it's more like a lowercase t. So, there is definitely a mistrust uh, of anybody that comes up and says, you know, I am the way. So, that postmodern world, it's this relationship to this, this new world that is even more scientific, even more technological, even more industrialized. And we do have a degree of mistrust and, and uh, uncertainty about those that tell us that, you know, they've got the solution, they've got the answer. So this is a short clip of what is postmodernism. And there is a little bit of explanation above and beyond with what I've already said. But what's kind of fun is the first minute or so, uh, the question is posed to people and yeah, it's kind of hard to explain because it's a difficult term. It's a difficult idea to sort of wrap our heads around because it is so many different things to so many different people. So have a look at this short clip and then I'll see you back in just a moment. Okay, so, so far, what have we said? We said that postmodernism has certain characteristics. It's highly skeptical. It seems to be kind of paranoid towards anybody making truth claims about modern society or hyper-modern society or post-capitalist society or whatever. Uh, reality is kind of fragmented. It's not holistic. It is not a totality. Uh, it's fragmented. Even the, the word community. Now, we're not quite sure what it means anymore because how many of you actually know the people that live down the street or in your own building? I mean, we, we all live in the same place, but do you really know them? So reality is presented as this, sort of this fragmented thing onto itself. And the connections between these fragmented pieces are not clear. Uh, it uses pastiche as an art form. And now what is pastiche? Um, it, it's, a, it's a pasting together of other art forms and fusing them into one. Rap culture and sampling is one. Uh, collage. Collage is, a, is another one. Uh, now collage started uh, roughly about a well, let's say 100 years ago, uh, 1910 and 1920s, the Dadaists and the Surrealists would make uh, pastiches and collages of other art pieces. They would cut up newspapers. And these in individuals, although they were doing this in the 20s, the, ten the, the teens and 20s, uh, really kind of hark and point to what becomes sort of the norm 20 or 30 years later, certainly after the Second World War. There's a use of satire, especially dark satire, like The Simpsons. There's ir irony and playfulness uh, in literature and artworks of all sorts. Um, there's also the fictional representation of actual events. Uh, this is something that becomes very, very strange because we have fictional accounts of actual events. Uh, the book uh, Libra, for example, by uh, Don DeLillo is a, a, it's a, well, it's a retelling fictional question mark retelling of Lee Harvey Oswald who had, had well was uh, considered to have, or thought to have assassinated John F Kennedy uh John F K in uh November 1963 uh my memory serves me right i was only 3 at the time but um uh, Lee Harvey Oswald uh had a mysterious life and as people sort of looked into his life began to cast doubt on whether or not he could have been the one or he could have also been one of many shooters etc cetera, etc cetera. So Don DeLillo takes these ideas, which are out in public domain, and creates a story. Now, the opposite, something that's much more recent, are reality shows. Reality shows which are allegedly about actual families or actual people. And uh, there's a ton of footage that's shot. Then it's kind of all chopped up to, to have characters look and act and behave in certain ways. 
So these are actual people who do, did actual things, but in at the editing table, uh, reality kind of gets reconstructed, right? And reconstructed to make people look like they're horrible or wonderful or neither. Um, there are these are fictionalized versions of real events, and this is something that is really characteristic of postmodernism. It all, also uses intertextuality. Uh, this is where you've got one media text that references another. Um, I'm not a big Stephen King fan, but I remember picking up one of his books, and I forget which which one it was. And uh, he said, "Oh my God, he looked like Sergeant Schultz." That's intertextuality. What does that even mean? Well, Stephen King was calling attention to a fictional television character from the 1960s. Uh, Sergeant Schultz was this kind of real Dummkopf, this uh, dopey uh, German prison guard at a concentration camp. Sounds pretty strange, but it was actually a comedy, bizarre as it sounds. But it was a comedy about these, uh, well, it was a group of POWs in this camp that obviously not awful. Uh, it was played for laughs. But what Stephen King was doing was calling attention to a character that the reader would know but that character exists in another fictional universe. So they are sort of brought together. Uh, they interact with one another. So intertextuality is one. Temporal distortions, uh, jumping back and forth in time. Uh, think of the movie uh, Inception, for example, that does exactly that. Or a, a Pulp Fiction that starts at a certain point in time, goes backwards, leads up to that moment and slightly past it. Um, fast forward and, you know, uh, jumping forward and backwards in time. All these kinds of things are very much postmodern. It's a different way to tell a story. Uh, there's a fascination with uh, technological culture, for, sh for sure. Hyper-reality, um, the information age, social media. Social media is very much a postmodern um, sort of world that we, we know about. And finally, the last one is, uh, is magic realism. And just like there is the fictional retelling of actual events, there is a, an imbuing or a, a layering on top of reality, a kind of fantastic magic uh, element that goes on top. And so we have these wonderful dreams, uh, dreamscapes. Uh, we have this sort of otherwise ordinary world imbued with this sort of fantastical um, sort of layering. Uh, Twin Peaks, if I don't know if you know that show, it came on in the early to mid 90s and in a sort of a new sort of uh, not a sequel, but a second part came out a couple of years ago on some of the cable stations. But Twin Peaks is a very good example of magic realism where we have this ordinary world that has this very dreamlike overlaying on top of it. So these two kind of worlds coexist. OK, so we have all these different things about postmodernism. Now, is it a fun place to live in? Well, we're in it, um, so we have no choice. But the next two clips, of what, what I want to show you is when these things kind of go off the rails, it can be sometimes a very terrifying place to, to live in. So thinking of all the stuff that I've just discussed, let's kind of look at a darker version of what postmodernism is all about. Now, there is comedic material in this, not in this clip, but we'll get to it. But I want you to have a look at this series called Oh Dear. This is uh, the second installment that came out in 2014 uh, by Adam Curtis. And we'll see another one of his clips in just a moment. But have a look at Oh Dear. It kind of gives you a glimpse into just the kind of the paranoia of what postmodernism is. Sorry about that. And we'll see you back in just a moment. Okay. So postmodern art, there's no distinction between high or low uh, art, high art, opera, ballet, classical music, and so on, low art, advertising, TV, internet porn, pulp fiction, graffiti, whatever. It's all the pop culture stuff, right? So high art, uh, the difference is, you know, the low art stuff we tend not to always pay for. We might, you know, be able to download it somewhere else. But high art, uh, it's kind of snooty, right? Let's go to the opera, uh, the ballet, you know, uh, the cinema, right? that kind of stuff. So high art is, it's for a certain kind of person. But postmodernism has managed to take the form, the form of high art, and insert a kind of lowly sort of culture. Well, if you don't, uh, if you don't know what I mean, here's a good example. Okay, Jerry Springer, the opera. It's a thing. I'm not kidding. You can look it up. So Jerry Springer, uh, because it's full of insane, crazy people that do insane, crazy things and love to tell other people about it. Um, the particular uh, lyricist and the the composer 
thought that Jerry Springer as a as an idea was worthy of an opera. So there it is. So high concept, low art, <laughs> or is it high art? It's still opera. Uh, Anna Nicole, uh, an opera based, uh, well, a tragedy, really, when you consider Anna Nicole Smith's uh, life, who may or may not have committed suicide, uh, drug overdose. So Anna Nicole Smith's life was really on the, on the on the level of tragedy. And that's what this opera deals with. Just like Jerry Springer, there are tragic elements in the lives of some of these people. But here we have kind of lowly content. Uh, Anna Nicole Smith got her start as a, I think, a guest jeans girl, uh, like a, a sort of doing guest, je uh, guest jeans ads, was seen by Hugh Hefner, ended up in Playboy, a uh, couple of films, and, you know, it's sort of her chat, her life tragically spun out of control, uh, drug use, and she died accidentally. That's pretty tragic. And the, again, the composer thought that her life was worth discussing in the format, in the, in the structure and format of, uh, of opera. It was worth it. So there's a really good example. Now, the second clip I'd like you to have a look at with Adam Curtis is living in an unreal world. And this is a world that, again, is, is we live in it, but do we? Are we, are we subjects of our own destiny or are we just objects, objects to be, to be looked at and to be sold and compartmentalized? So have a look at it. This, it's pretty downbeat. It borders on paranoia. But it's a very effective way to kind of describe visually what this postmodern world is all about. So have a look at that and then we'll come back in just a moment. So some of the people that uh, have talked about postmodernism, um, I've noticed and I can pull books out from behind me right there because that's not a picture. That's my actual library. Um, the French theorists have really sort of become concerned with modernity, uh, uh, modernism, and certainly postmodernism. And so I uh, just want to take a very brief look at some of the different ideas that, uh, that have been, you know, sort of bandied around and discussed. So postmodern uh, means different things to different people, depending on the field that they're in. Uh, Jean Baudrillard, and he is the author of this book right here. You see his name right there, Jean Baudrillard, The System of Objects, right? Interesting title, The System of Objects. Okay, so Baudrillard thinks that that postmodern condition um, is is quite evident. We can see this these shifts in social structures, social relationships, and the way in which technology has now kind of created an image-dominated world, which kind of subverts the way that we interact with each other, with reality, with ourselves, and the end result is really kind of strange because what's happened is this. It's a society of the spectacle. Now, this is the book by Guy Debord, written in 1967. Guy Debord is a French theorist. Uh, and this book, written one year later. So it was kind of in the air, right? People are really trying to make sense of what was going on. So the postmodern modern condition, this um, increasingly technological interaction that we have with each other and with the world. And it is drenched in images, right? We are endlessly deferred some degree of happiness by images. You know, buy this, you'll be happy. Uh, go here, you'll, it'll be wonderful. So we live in this image dominated world that really at the end of the day kind of starts to subvert our understanding, our belief in reality. And so what's happened now is it becomes a new form of communication. We, com we communicate not with each other, but through images of each other, right? We, we just, we talk to each other and this new form of communication is taking the place of face-to-face -face exchange. Now think about how often you've decided to send a text rather than call. That's Baudrillard, right? Okay, well, you've sent a text. Yeah, you're communicating, but you know, if I have a choice, I'd rather not talk to them, you know. That's a concern because we should be able to speak to one another. We should be able to speak to each other clearly, honestly. Oh, see, what am I doing? I am the way, do it this way, right? Be careful. Some people just find it's, it's easier, right? Let's say you're on the bus, it's really noisy, a friend texts you. Of course, you're not going to pick up the phone, it's easier to text. So come on, sir, you know, give me a break. It's true. So, what Baudrillard wants us to think about is how these new forms of communication are changing 
right? Our changing face-to-face -face communication to the point where we are living almost in simulations. Um, objects, uh, ideas, discourses seem to have no clear referent because everything refers to something else. And, you know, if it's an intertextual world where Stephen King can, you know, quote Sergeant Schultz from a TV show and you're reading a fictional book, it's fiction piled on top of fiction piled on top of fiction. So there's no real origin, right? There's no real referent. There's no ground. There's no foundation. And you're probably wondering why do I have a picture of the Kardashians? They are the absolute example for me of this world of simulations. Well, these people wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be famous if it wasn't for the fact that, you know, their, uh, their dad, uh, Kardashian, I forget his first name, a very famous lawyer who defended uh, O.J. Uh, Sim uh, Simpson, made a lot of money, became very known uh, or very well known through that and made a lot of cash. And their kids basically rode his coattails. And now all of them are literally famous for being famous. And that's a that's a very American thing, but also a very postmodern thing. What do you do? Nothing. I'm just famous for doing stuff. That's a simulation. We don't really know who these people are. We don't know if the world that we are privileged to watch during, you know, watching, uh, keeping up the car with the Kardashians is even true. So you got to be careful. Now, Rick and Morty, Rick and Morty embrace this, the, the simulation, embrace this no reference, no, you know, this, this world that is drenched in images. Um, there's lots and lots of clips from Rick and Morty. I think this one, Interdimensional TV, is one of my favorites because it is mildly insane. And it's very absurd, but it plays with this idea that we have no referent, no sort of transcendent goal. We are just drenched in images and we watch it and we recognize what it is, even though it is this, this weird mutation of either a TV commercial selling appliances or an action show. Rick and Morty play with it because they know that the world is absurd. So have a look at it. And we'll see you back in just a moment. Okay, so another uh, individual who is or was very concerned with postmodernism, uh, Jean-François Lyotard, who wrote this book right here, The Postmodern Condition, A Report on Knowledge. And people were so concerned that he had to follow it up with this book, The Postmodern Explained. So Jean-François Lyotard looks at postmodernism uh, as again, remember I said people that come up with these transcendent eternal truths, I am the way. Well, those are called meta narratives, right? Everything all lined up in a row, all your ducks are in a row and everything just makes sense. Well, because we know that the world doesn't make sense, it's fragmented, it's absurd, it's incomprehensible. Anybody that claims to have this meta narrative, you know, a story about stories or a story about history or any of the kind of stuff, um, we kind of reject that. So postmodernism rejects these great narratives that typically, or at least used to give us some degree of stability, uh, predictability. And humor, what does it do? It, it upends that. It subverts that. So the stability that we have of language, uh, think of all the words that keep, you know, moving in and out. Things mean one thing, uh, you know, dope and fat and sick and all these are words, you know, again, from, from a certain culture, uh, move into the mainstream, get used by people. Sometimes they have no idea what it really means and it's laughable. But the stability of language starts to erode when, when people pick and choose what words will mean amongst the, themselves. And if they are influential, guess what? Now other people start doing the same thing. So language isn't stable. Social and cultural norms aren't stable, which now affects the ability to be incongruous in jokes because we have almost have to remind people, well, this is what we were typically expecting. Here's the joke. The problem with postmodernism is that we're seeing social and cultural norms upended more and more in, in real life. So with postmodernism and postmodern art in particular, we have a plurality of styles, right? A, uh, a variety of styles and movements and concepts that just basically work together, right? There's no one style that is sort of the most important, you know, the realist style, neo-realism, neo-realism, neo whatever it may be, conceptual art, performance art, everything is up for grabs, everything is valid. So if that's the case, if everything's up for grabs and everything's relative, we make, we, we find it very difficult to measure the value of one style over another. If they're all even and they're all worthy of following and pursuing, 
There's really no one style or concept that's any better than the other. High art is no better or worse than low art. Really, that's what they're saying. So it's contradictory. Uh, it's also because when you start talking about these kinds of things, also very political. The notion of postmodernism seems to be something that the at least the response to it seems to be somewhat left of center, while those that respond negatively towards postmodernism and all of the things I've just talked about tend to be right of center, right? And that's why it is a kind of uh, political statement to say that, yeah, everything is relative. You know, e anything goes. Uh, another, uh, now this is, again, not French, but uh, an Italian uh, writer, Umberto Eco, wrote books like this, uh, Opera Aperta, uh, uh, of the open work. Again, this is the book he wrote in uh, in the mid-60s. Uh, Umberto Eco talks about postmodernism as a kind of a uh, sign of cultural exhaustion. Uh, it's impossible to say anything new or original or simply reframing things. Now, whether it's sample culture or reframing pictures um, or taking one fictional character and having them, having them exist in another fictional universe, everything's already been said, right? We, we, all we can do is look at things ironically or in a kind of cliched sort of way. And when we do that, we can be ironic and humorous about it, but we have to admit that everything's already been said. It's kind of hard to be unique and original at this point. And guess what? When everything's already been said, uh, there's a whole lot of lawsuits coming up. And just over the last few years, um, lawsuits against Led Zeppelin, Madonna, Justin Bieber, Robin Thicke, Shakir, Ed Sheeran, and the list goes on. Um, what's happening is people think they can sort of change things around just ever so slightly, you know, reframe it uh, and call it their own. So what's happened is that cultural exhaustion really now is appearing literally everywhere. So there's a very thin line between inspiration and, and thievery. Because on the one hand, I want to make my song sound like this. And is it is it truly original or is it kind of plagiarizing? Um, the tune right now for me, uh, Leave the Door Open, uh, Bruno Mars. I'm going crazy trying to figure out what song he's ripped off. He hasn't ripped off a song. What he and his songwriting friends have done is created this song that is an homage to, I'm going to say, the early Philly sound, say the early 70s, the Delphonics, uh, you know, bands like that. Uh, the, the Dramatics is another one. Those bands sounded like the way he sounds. So Bruno Mars is emulating in a very, you know, sort of honorific sort of way, um, the sounds of that era without stealing one particular song. I can hear bits of one song and bits of another, really clever. And it is an homage, but it is part of the already said. Now, Bruno Mars embraces that and says, I want to have a song that sounds like this era. Now, thinking of that, uh, although there is, you know, cultural exhaustion, the idea that everything's already been said, um, well, there are those folks that can take that and run with it in a very humorous way. I don't know if you know who Reggie Watts is. Um, very funny guy. I think he's working with uh, James Corden now, uh, directing his band. But what Reggie Watts does here is he plays with the all the always already said. And uh, when you listen to him, you imagine this sounds like a blues song. This sounds like a R&B song, a soul song, or whatever. So what Reggie Watts is doing is he's playing with all these little cultural signifiers that tell us the listener. Oh, this is what kind of song it is, but it's all gibberish. It's a love song about oatmeal for crying out loud. <laughs> it's, it's very funny. So watch it, enjoy it in its, its wonderful, disorienting, absurd kind of way, because that's what Reggie Watts does very well. But think of all the ideas I've just presented to you. This sort of doesn't quite sound like this. I, it kind of reminds me of whatever. That's what he's playing with, that postmodern condition that we find ourselves in, uh, experiencing something that is brand new and yet sounds like we've heard it before. So check it out and I'll see you back in a moment. Okay, so here, uh, not only in music, as we saw with uh, or heard with Reggie Watts, but it happens in art. And art, uh, René uh, Magritte's Empire of Light, painted in 1954. Uh, Magritte uh, was a surrealist. So this is a painting uh, made in 19... 54. And, uh, well, along comes the horror film, The Exorcist in 1973. And, hmm, kind of is an homage or is it plagiarizing Magritte's painting? 
because we can we can think about it when i first saw that poster i mean i was 13 at the time i didn't think that it came from somewhere but when i saw magritte's painting it reminded me of the poster poster of the exorcist so there is there is that crosstalk right that kind of crosstalk back and forth in art in culture high and low culture because magritte is a painter the exorcist is a film these two uh forms of art do they do coexist but not in the same universe but given the content of a poster and a, and a piece of art uh, they do coexist rather well right we can see where these ideas are coming from now again uh magritte's the pleasure principle 1937 uh, John Fox, a former singer of Ultravox, uh, has been recording since about uh, the early 1980s under his own name, doing mostly electronic music. Uh, the Pleasures of Electricity from 2001. Looks familiar, doesn't it? Homage? Very likely. Plagiarism? Hopefully not. Uh, the idea is the hope that we see this John Fox, co uh, John Fox cover and we go, ah, this reminds me of a painting by Magritte, right? That should be the way it should work. Uh, again, Magritte, he's a guy that a lot of people like to steal from. The Blank Signature, 1965. And compare that to uh, an, al an album cover by the band Styx, the, the Chicago band Styx. Uh, they're on classic rock all the time. The Grand Illusion, which came out in 1977. So really not that much longer, 12 years later. So here's the painting, and there's the album cover. So we've got a film poster, an album two album covers coming from the world of high art that's what postmodernism is so what do we have here three main things to think about baudrillard's world that is image dominated it is it in fact subverts our interaction with reality um, we stare at our phones for much too long the world is basically filtered through the phone and we don't think about it because it seems to be normal and this becomes normalized and baudrillard up until he passed away in 2008 became increasingly concerned with it Jean-François Lyotard talks about that skepticism between meta-narratives or the truth with a capital T. Any way that we try to explain the world in any kind of comprehensive way, uh, people shy away from it. Now, you're, you're not telling me the truth. Uh, you've got a hidden agenda. There's something else going on. And finally, Umberto Eco, the Italian writer, uh, talks about cultural exhaustion, the impossibility of being original, um, no matter what the art form is. So kind of not drab but kind of depressing kind of kind of a downer but there is there is the possibility to f spin comedic gold out of this stuff uh lance olson for example thinks that humor aligns with postmodern thinking because of the following things and he's got a point if everything is relative and nobody has that one position of authority right with a capital t truth we can actually subvert those centers of authority we can undermine them. We can we can make fun of them. We can satirize them. Uh, SNL, that's really their bread and butter. And especially over the last four years with Trump in office, that's what they were doing. Because everything is relative and anything goes, it also rejects a singular vision. Uh, the you know That single, I am the way kind of vision. This is the only way to understand the world. And people are going, no. No, as a matter of fact, um, my lived reality tells me that this is just absolutely wrong. Well, lived realities now become much more important. And this is, again, a postmodern condition because we can, we can uh, undermine and subvert authority. We can also subvert bigots, cranks, idiots, racists, sexists. Those people are ripe for, for comedy and sat satire because of the positions they take. And post postmodernism allows us a whole range of ways to do it. So what happens is it short circuits, right? Uh, the tendency for culture to repress certain pieces of information because of social media for example as soon as something is allegedly taken down it's already been viewed by a few thousand people it's already being shared right for better or worse so it kind of short circuits the ability of authority figures to not only present their vision as the only one but uh, the vision that they present we can subvert it because we can do that using social media or at least having some comedic view of the world right we're not going to sweat the, sweat the small stuff but we're going to matter we're going to think about what really matters so uh both postmodernism and humor they may be they may appear to be destructive but they're also constructive because what they do is they embrace 
plural, uh, plurality. They embrace the everything goes uh, idea. The language games, right? Word games, um, goofy things that we can say with uh, to each other, uh, you know, that make us laugh. And these are games that allow us that, that kind of mental flexibility. And play in, and inclusivity is very important in postmodernism. Virtually anyone can create a meme and post it online. Now, whether it gets shared is another story, but through, you know, Twitter, Facebook, whatever, whatever you're on, Discord, um, all of these uh, social media platforms allow virtually anyone to usurp and subvert those voices of authority. So the notion of play inclusivity is very much a good thing. So you got to nail Trump. I'm sorry, he's no longer in office. He's citizen Trump and he's in a whole lot of trouble and I couldn't be happier. But here's a good example of humor aligning with postmodern thinking where we subvert right those positions of authority so this is life according to trump it's about a minute and a half long and even if he's not in uh, in office it's still pretty funny so have a look at it we'll see you back in a moment okay so play is something that we've had in civilization uh they used to be part of social structures there was always going to be room for people to play and sort of invent and be creative because that is important remember uh Henri bergson's idea of that elan vital right that creative force or that life force well that's play right that's play that's something that is not only creative but is actually created civilization itself so uh, it should be looked at optimistically and should be valued because humorous play is really what identifies us as the individuals that we are. So play is always creative. It's always sort of trying to think uh, new ways of dealing with things, thinking, you know, thinking outside the box. I hate that metaphor, but we'll use it for now. Um, and play is a good way to keep those authority figures in check. I guarantee you, Trump knows how many how many times he was laughed at because he would watch Bill uh, Mayer or Mahar, um, you know Jimmy Fallon, uh, uh, the rest of them, um, St Stephen uh, Stephen Colbert, all these people. He knows he know he knows who they are. He knows he would be made fun of. But guess what? For him, he, it was better for him to be talked about. That was more important to him than being laughed at. So as long as people are talking about him, even in a humorous way, hey, still talking about him. And that feeds into his narcissism. So if we can be playful towards these authority figures, we can keep them in check. We can laugh at them. So when we're playful, we're typically not, you know, serious. Uh, we're not focused on one single thing. We're keeping the options open, right? What ifs? Lots of what ifs. What if we do this and that, that and change this? Uh, so as we're thinking creatively and humorously and playfully, uh, our thinking can be all over the place. It can be contradictory. It could converge, diverge, uh, it can do any number of things. And so we do it as just a thing in itself, right? We know eventually we're going to figure something out. And when we reach that lowercase truth, right, it's going to work. It's going to work for us because that's something that we can do. And we do it by being able to communicate with one another in that playful manner. Now, this clip here, um, uh, Taylor Molly, I don't know who, who he is. Um, but he does say some really interesting things. I apologize for the sound being ever so slightly off, which is kind of ironic for a uh, YouTube video and communication, but it's, it's still watchable. So what he's doing in a very playful way is discussing something serious. Uh, and, the, and really his whole bit, it's like two minutes long, his whole bit is we need to trust that what we talk about, what we speak about, is worthy of an, an, another person's attention. We should speak with at least some degree of authority rather than end everything with what sounds like an invisible question mark. And yes, it seems to contradict what I've just said, but if everything is relative, should we not be able to speak, you know, speak truth to power, speak our peace, uh, speak from our position, but we should do it with a degree of certainty because it's our lived reality. It's not a media image soaked reality that I'm not quite sure what I'm doing. It's my lived reality. So what Taylor Molly is talking about, and again, in a funny, playful way, is the seriousness of communication. So it is funny, but it has a very serious message uh, within it. So have a look at that and we'll see you back in just a moment. 
Now, the notion of play, the idea of play, is certainly not uh, something that is specific to postmodernism. It is an aspect of it, but it certainly is celebrated and has been celebrated for many years. Aristotle, writing in 340 BC, roughly, a long time ago, 2,500 years ago, uh, more so, he, uh, Aristotle talks about play as, you know, kind of a an adjunct, uh, an other moment in time where we can at least step away from active labor. Now, I don't think Aristotle did a whole lot. He owned slaves. He was an aristocrat. He owned property. So it was a nice idea. But I digress once more. Aristotle, false or not, said, look, play should be a complement to a life that is otherwise, you know, uh, mental labor, labor, physical labor. We need to chill, right? We need to chill periodically. And Aristotle is saying, yes, have at it. It's a good thing, right? It makes you makes a good person. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, picture we see right there, said the same thing. The play should be an antidote to the drudgery, right, of, of active, you know, uh, mental labor, active labor, all those things. There needs to be a time when we just decompress, right? We call it decompressing right now. And look at that. Historically, it's something that's been discussed for about 2,500 years. Ever since we've had enough time to think about the fact that, well, I'm tired. I got I to gotta stop, right? And when we stop, our minds are still active, but in a more playful, creative kind of way. So humor is based on just that kind of creative, playful uh, interaction. They're not exactly the same. Um, if play was a necessary condition for humor, uh, humor does a whole lot of other things. Uh, just in the same way that play does a whole lot of other things. We're just playing for the sheer, you know, the sheer act of playing. Uh, if you're around little kids, they're not trying to be funny. They're just having fun. And they'll take something and they, they imagine it's something else. And if, if you give them a box of Lego, look out, right? They're, they're busy for hours. But the point is, playfulness and humor do work together, but they each can stand on their own. So humor can be a variety of different styles, but play and play theory is, this is what this is. This is play theory that can be sort of inserted into this kind of broader view of what we consider to be funny. Um, if we're playing or goofing around, we're doing silly things, that's us. That's us being human beings. So the notion of playing, um, they're not exactly the same uh, because there are other forms of play, just, uh, just like there are other forms of humor. So there is much interaction, such as we see here in Big Bang Theory. Um, the clip is just called Pictionary. You probably have seen it already. So we get to see, you know, Sheldon is his usual obnoxious self uh, playing Pictionary. And yes, we're laughing, but they're doing something playful. But to us, the viewer, through all the humor, we're getting to see kind of a character study at the same time, mostly of Sheldon, uh, because... Again, Sheldon, to me, would be much more like, uh, oh, I don't know, like Plato. <laughs> you know, very smart, but very aloof and always looking down the end of his low nose at other people. And that's what the, the Pictionary clip is all about. So have a look at it and we'll see you back in a moment. Now, we've talked about postmodernism. We started off kind of really heavy and almost bordering on depressing. Um, and then we kind of lightened things up, talking about its positive, humorous aspects. And not everybody embraces postmodernism in, in the way that we've just described it. You know, this uh, Umberto Eco or Lyotard um, and, and Baudrillard. Uh, Terry Eagleton, who wrote this book right here. Whoops, there we are, After Theory. Um, he says, look, postmodernism is a kind of what he calls an intellectual dead end. Because if we are critiquing every intellectual position, we're, we're saying that, no, not a single one of them is worthy of, of pursuing uh, as, as, again, the royal road, you know, to, to, a, to a better way of life, to the truth. So he says postmodernism, one of, the, one of the most negative aspects of it is the fact that it is nothing but rel rela like relations. Everything is relative. Uh, one position is as, as useful as another, and that's always not the case. Um, so... If that's the case, that the that subversive impulse he believes is not constructive, the fact that everyone has a say, everyone's opinion counts, uh, but he finds it actually destructive. And so this is something that is of great concern to Eagleton. And he says, look, there's two things that are going on here that refer to intellect the history of you know intellectual development. And he says, look, we are in a position now 
that we are by resisting these master narratives, the things that Lyotard points out. Now remember, Lyotard is not a fan of the rejection of meta narratives. He's simply pointing it out. Just like Plato was not a, was not a fan of superiority theory, right? In terms of humor, he was simply pointing it out. So Eagleton says, by resisting master narratives, postmodernism questions the Enlightenment view of reason and progress. Now, part of the reason why we are doing this is because the Enlightenment view of reason and progress have ultimately led to not one but two world wars, the ability of science to destroy us many times over with you know with atomic weapons, um, the degree of destruction that that Enlightenment thinking has led to. Now, many good things, but also in terms of science and technology, many many bad things, and so that postmodern uh, view of reason and progress working together clearly is now is up for grabs because we have survived a degree of carnage that the world has not seen up until that point and it still goes on there is a war happening somewhere and uh, Eagleton says you know if that's the case it questions the notion of progress and reason well this is why postmodern thinkers are saying yeah <laughs> that's not a bad thing because look at what it's look what it's brought us to right the brink of nuclear destruction so Eagleton says, in terms of thinking, we need to maybe look at that again. And he says, by favoring, uh, favoring relativism, it argues that questions of truth or value depend on context or perspective. And again, this notion that uh, individuals can have their say, they can speak truth to power, marginalized voices, uh, disempowered voices, voices that have been, you know, up to this point or hitherto silenced, are now we can hear uh, from them. So relativism and the resisting of master narratives on the one hand can be viewed by people as good, right? This is a good thing. We are now going to question those authority figures that led us to the, you know, the brink of nuclear destruction. That's a good thing. But others like Eagleton. Now, Eagleton is not asking us to embrace nuclear destruction. He's not. What he's asking us to do is to consider some of the negative as aspects of postmodernism and saying, look, if we are going to uh, reject enlightenment, reason, and progress, are we going to replace it with something else? Are we going to never try to progress any further than where we are now? Like, that's not historically something we've done. And two, um, truth and what is valuable in terms of truth statements, should they always just have to do with context? Can we look at a historical reality? Can we look at a historical perspective? Those things are worth looking at. Eagleton doesn't say he's got the answers, but certainly it's worth looking at because it is, it's serious. So that is the end of part one of humor and postmodernism. Uh, sorry to bring you down with some of the, the videos, but they're at the very least thought provoking. But next week, we're going to look at postmodernism again, the second part, and look at the, the role and the relationship of humor in this postmodern world. So a uh, little under an hour, I'm glad, because uh, we covered a lot of stuff. Uh, I'll see you for sure on Monday. I uh, hope you all turn out, and then we can cover some of this material, and you can ask questions. Um, and uh, and I also will do a very short um, sort of overview of Module 9, because we didn't have a chance to do that this past week. So take care, and we'll see you soon.